Hello, welcome to Swiss Watch King. As you know, I present you new watchmakers on the channel all the time. So today is no different. We have a new guest here, Rone Beckendorf from Denmark. So welcome to the studio and thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having me. Of course, my pleasure. How you been? Very busy, very good. Yeah. Lots of watches, it's great. So essentially you created your own brand and you popped on my radar and I knew I had to show this to my audience as well because that's kind of the thing of this channel. So how did you start with watchmaking? My beginning is both a long and short story. I have always wanted to be a watchmaker yeah. since I was a baby. I've been fascinated with watches and things with hands and dials and stuff. So I've always known I wanted to be a watchmaker. But then, you know, you go to watchmaking school, you learn stuff. I went to work with uh, Mr. Thomas Prescher, mm, get nice. some experience in the artisanal work with making watches. What was the craziest thing you worked on or that you maybe saw at his atelier? Because he well, doesn't make many watches. But the ones he makes is they're crazy. Yeah, yeah well, the, the craziest watches he makes is the triple axis flying tourbillons. Yeah. That's <laughs> a crazy piece. We'll put a picture up there because I'm sure most of you haven't seen this uh, before. It's like a thing you find like on forums or like really yeah, in yeah. the rabbit hole. Like yeah, the, exactly. The, the, this the, is the deep end. Yeah. <laughs> underground stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, but then uh, I went back to Denmark and I, for the last 10 years or so, I've done restoration and conservation mm -hmm. of historical pieces. So I work for public and private collections in Denmark and uh, I've restored watches and clocks from around 1600 until modern pieces. And I see a lot of watches that have been made good, that's been made bad and mm. great stuff that's never going to be forgotten and some stuff that might be, be forgotten button somehow. <laughs> uh, and then my old will to create something, it, it, it grew again. So I started making watches like I, I did as a young watchmaker. Horology is a four or five hundred years long tradition, lots of great masters. So my whole idea is to put a little uh, dot in that history. So what did you bring to us today? Because I see there's four watches here. As far as I know, this is the last one, the one I like the most because it's yes. uh, more open world and I think you also see the movement here. But what's on your wrist and the other ones? Like, so was this the beginning or? Yeah, well, the, the whole thing started five years ago mm -hmm. and I wanted to create a watch. And I found a box with new old stock Perseur movements, yeah. the 7001, awesome. uh, from the Perseur factory. So not a, so before ETA took it over. Yeah. And I had these 42 movements and I was like, these need a home because yeah. they've been living in a box in a basement for 50 years. They were a decent new old stock. And for that, I did the, this uh, first piece, which is also, I'm wearing the prototype. Yeah. It's called Buria. This is Old Norse for beginnings, mm -hmm. which I thought was a fitting title for my first series production watch. That makes sense. It's a 42 millimeter case in steel and raw bronze, so it patinates over time. Oh, nice, nice. And then uh, the dial is raw brass as well. Mm -hmm. It's a thing, I really like the thing with living materials. Over time, they patinate, they get... The watch kind of grows with you, huh? in a way. Yeah, exactly. They start out more or less the same, not completely, they are handmade. Then they take off with their owner and it, it becomes really a piece unique, mm -hmm. depending on how you wear it and all these things. So what essentially do you make on this watch? Because we had watchmakers here, which you know get components from other suppliers or the cases. Yeah, so some of them make everything. Yeah. So here I made all the parts you can see except the crystal and the, and the strap. Mm. So wow. I manufactured the crown, the bezel, the case bag, the dial, the hands, and the middle case in bronze and the screws as well. Mm. So they're made at my workshop. And these first pieces were hand engraved by uh, Anne Law Less, an amazing engraver. And she did stunning work on these engravings. Beautiful, very simple looking watch. So inside here is the Peso yeah. 7001, huh? Yeah. And uh, the whole idea is also, because it's raw materials, that the case is constructed so you can refinish it. Mm -hmm. So I don't want any tampon uh, printing, I don't want uh, lacquers, stuff like that. Yeah. So if there's a marking, it's engraved and filled with lacquer, like, like the old French clocks with a guilloche mm -hmm. uh, silver dial. It can be horrible, all black, you cannot see anything, but you strip it down to bare silver, you fill the engraving with black lacquer and you, you give it shellac again and it looks like new. And that's the same type of longevity I want to bring to the construction of my watches. So the goal is uh, essentially for somebody in the future to be able to restore it as well? Yeah. I've like been, you do now. Exactly. For others. Huh? Exactly. Nice. I've seen stuff that's been done so it's very easy to restore and it gives the piece longevity. And then I've seen some that is quite frankly made to not be restored and I want I, I don't want to give any headaches to my, yeah, yeah. my future my future colleagues. No, of course, yeah. 
And this is the same watch, just a yes. smaller size? Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is a new one I just uh, released. It's the 38 millimeter version mm -hmm. because even though it wears very well because it's quite slim and it's without locks, yeah, exactly. it, it, but it's 42. Some people don't like that. They don't like it on paper, I think. Yeah. In person, it's like, oh, it's actually a small watch. Yeah, exactly. But uh, a very good uh, customer of mine, he convinced me I should do a, a 38 yeah, millimeter yeah, version. Sense. But when you remove uh, four millimeters of the cage, I had to do some constructive changes. So it, it has like cinder. Mm -hmm. Locks yeah. and uh, easy change strap system. You just need a little screwdriver and you can swap out for different straps. Mm -hmm. How do you change the strap here? It's the same as with a lock case, but you just go from the back. You can do it very okay. easily. Yeah, gotcha. But you know, every time you put sharp stuff near a watch, you, you, can, you can scratch it. I mean, the size and shape reminds me of the uh, Viani Halter Classic watch. Well, that Also a very small piece, yeah. uh, but again, people love to wear it as well. Huh? I think it's a good size, even for me. I mean, I can wear both, obviously, but of uh, I wouldn't mind the smaller one for sure. Yeah. So what's the deal with uh, with these watches regarding production, pricing as well? So you sold out, you have something available, so because usually... Mm, all my look... watches are still available in mm -hmm. some, not as much as, as many, and they are in the 6,000 and 8,000 euro range. When the movement is not built by me, yeah. it takes away a lot it of the sense. cost. So I mean, actually, I think for the amount of stuff you do yourself, it's on the affordable side. Because mm. I know brands that do less themselves and are the same price as you. So I try to be uh, transparent in yeah. the way I work and I try to do a fair price. And I'm also honest about, I'm not an in-house extremist. Yeah. Uh, if there is some part of the production that can raise the quality of the yeah. final piece, I have no problem outsourcing something. Mm -hmm. I like to do the things myself. I am the watchmaker. Yeah. I want to be the master, but I'm not going to slack quality just for me yeah. to say I've done it myself. Yeah, makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. Awesome. Because you know, usually we have watchmakers here on the channel with uh, sold out collections. Mm -hmm. So my audience is always happy and also anxious and sad because well, they, they can't buy stuff. You of know? course. So, you can, you can actually you can, use that. You can buy, but you need to be fast. <laughs> yeah, you, you need fast, to be fast. Exactly. exactly. So, uh, what is the story behind this watch? So, this is my latest piece. This is the prototype of a new series I'm doing, limited to 10 pieces. Mm -hmm. um, like a subscription piece or...? Yeah, kinda. It's, the prototype is done and uh, you pay a deposit for, for me to start. But the first watches will be delivered in a year's time or so. Mm -hmm. Uh, nice. This is an old idea I got from my work with tower clocks. I saw a tower clock in Copenhagen made by a very famous Danish horologist and astro mechanic called Jens Olsen. And inside, on the movement, you have this mechanism that allows you to set the time. You cannot see outside the turret when you're inside with the movement. So there's a little mechanism that shows you what the, the dials on the outside of the building are showing. It's based on two revolving discs and a pair of stationary hands in an L. And when I saw this, I thought, this is going to be a crazy good indication for a wristwatch. Yeah. I love novel ways of indicating time, not just a, you know, a three-hander. I like to yeah. experiment a bit. It also gives the collector something to, to of course, do. something new that he yeah. hasn't seen before. Obviously. Exactly. The name for this model is it, which is a old Norse word, which means lineage, generation, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And it really is a study into the DNA of Copenhagen watchmaking. Mm -hmm. The case is, as the other watches, steel and bronze, a combination I like to work with. But the movement itself is constructed for this piece and it is based on the Copenhagen DNA of watchmaking. From around the end of the 1700s until the middle of the 1800s, there were quite a bit of production of pocket watches in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. They look a lot like Parisian continental style work. But you see, they do some stylistic choices, they do some technical choices that more and more go away from Parisian work. So it starts to become a bit Danish, a little bit brutish, a little bit yeah. farmer. The most famous is the Jürgensen family, so yeah. Robin Jürgensen, course, yeah. Jürgensen, all this, but also Wilschertz, Langbälle, Rank. I need, to, I need to write those down. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and um, Do some research. But then 1850s, Swiss Bush movements became so cheap they that everybody... They just stopped. Huh? Yeah, they huh? just stopped working. And my whole idea with my creative side has been to... How would this have looked if it had lived until now and it had mm. become an eau de lingerie piece? Yeah. Because a lot of eau de lingerie is Genevan in style mm. and it wouldn't be very authentic 
for me to do Genevan watchmaking when I really am a Copenhagen watchmaker. I'm in the guild of yeah. of watchmakers in Copenhagen. We are from 1755, mm. still going strong. And I want to figure out how would this have looked. Yeah. So the movement is constructed with a three-quarter plate. Mm -hmm. It's pillared. Is it German silver or no? Yeah, it's German yeah. silver, which is not totally um, historically it's relevant. It's not Danish silver. No. No, it really isn't. <laughs> it's actually also sourced from Switzerland. I, uh, I, I oh, want the best material. Uh -huh. Gotcha now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's this free quarter plate. It's pillared, so it's not the normal construction with thick bridges that are screwed down. It's yeah. flat bridges uh, on pillars. You have steel work for the bearing of the barrel mm -hmm. and uh, a separate balance cock, which is made of steel that is holding the end of the half spring. So there's the separate cork for the hairspring and yeah. part of the aesthetic. Preserving the Copenhagen style then, of watchmaking. Yeah. Exactly. I'm trying not to recreate and be like a role player, but mm -hmm. to reimagine it and do a practical auto lingerie piece. Mm -hmm. So I also have the polished anglage, but I still kept the sablage very fine mm -hmm. with no fancy striping or stuff like that yeah. because they, they wouldn't do that. Looks very nice. Thank you. And the front is, uh, reading the time is actually really easy, you know, once yeah, you get it, twisted, it, obviously. Exactly. It's more or less like a digital watch. Mm -hmm. So you have the shorthand pointing at the minute dial, both sweeping. Yeah. And you have the little seconds indicator at the bottom, yeah. which is also running. So you have some Movement, indication yeah. of something happening. Yeah, very nice. I have a book full of ideas. Mm. And uh, I let one of my very good friends and collectors uh, look into it. And he said, this idea, yes, I want this. Yeah. And I was like, it, I love this idea as well. We should work on it. Yeah. And it started out being a module built on, on another movement. Mm -hmm. But I realized if I want a case that's not thick and big, it wasn't possible at all. So I bit the apple and made a new caliber for this indication. So essentially, like with the others, this is all made by you, but in this case, even the whole movement, correct? More or less. The, the gear train and the escapement is from an historical movement, the Adolf Shield 1130, yeah. which is one of my favorite movements. The barrel and stuff like that, I had to redo because of my construction. Mm -hmm. When I move the minute hand all the way towards the crown, there's very little space for the normal winding and setting. So I had to do also a classical old one that in old English pieces, which is the rocking bar winding and setting. What material are the dials from? The sector, the name plaque and the dials are made of zirconium oxide. Okay. So it's a ceramic. Yeah, cream, beige, that's yeah, why yeah, it, it looks it, nice. Yeah, it's very lovely. You can also polish it so it's mm. flat and very shiny. This is the ground finish, so yeah. it's it's a bit more subtle and it has this matte finish. This is the prototypes. I'm still working on the marking because I don't want to print. Dial, yeah. print the name and print the scales. I want them to be engraved in engraved the material. In, uh... And that's very hard in this size and in this yeah. material. So I'm working with a supplier that works with zirconium oxide and uh, we are trying to perfect this process. Nice. And what's the price point again? So people can imagine, you know, because sometimes we show stuff like this, which yeah. can be 300,000. Yeah. So we never know, okay, is it going to be a lot or a reasonable? Well, number or it doesn't it? have a tourbillon, so it's okay. not going to be so... up there, but um, this is going to be a series of 10 pieces. Mm -hmm. Most of them are sold, but there's still some left, so be quick. <laughs> um, and the price is 26,000 francs. Yeah. You don't make the, the rubies? I don't make the rubies either. Yeah. Then it's not worth it. Huh? <laughs> I'm kidding. There's one guy I met who makes his own rubies. Huh? Well, you, um, I've, I've had to make rubies, but I do that for restoration for very special pieces. This is crazy work. Awesome. So what's what's next for you after you sell these? Do you want to go into complications? Do you want to go into different ways of displaying time? Yeah. What's your like, you know, I have two grail watch you want to make? Right now I have two ideas I'm working on. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still going with this. I'm still discovering the Copenhagen style watchmaking and Next, I'm diving into the mechanism itself because mm -hmm. this is a, a lever watch with mm -hmm. a Swiss lever yeah. escapement, which is a very nice escapement. But in the 1800s in Copenhagen, there were uh, some other escapements that were very prominent, which is very hard to do good. No. But when you do it good, it, it's a great type timekeeper. So I'm, I'm delving into this novel escapement that has been not used a lot for the last 100 years or so. Mm -hmm. So this is exploring the depth of historical watchmaking in Copenhagen. And I love calendars. Yeah. I love moon faces. I don't know if you know the moon clock I did some years ago. No, you'll show me a photo. <laughs> and um, 
I really love new ways of indicating time. So I have this new idea, which is something with wandering hours, jumping hours, okay, stuff okay. like that. So I have some ideas. You have plenty of uh, watches to create. Well, Rona, this was awesome. It was nice to meet you in person and see all these beautiful creations. I'm happy that it's going well for you. Huh? Uh, thank you for having me. Show some love. I'm going to put all the links in the video description below. Follow him on Instagram, check out the website. And again, if you want to buy one of these watches, there's still a few available, but as always on this channel, be quick. Thank you for watching, and as always, I'll see you next week.